we'd like to invite our next speaker. There he is, TJ McDonald. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I'm going to introduce you a little bit and then you can take it away with your presentation. Uh, yeah. So uh, background for TJ. Um, back in November 1990, uh, Typhoon Owen struck a tiny remote atoll where TJ served as a Peace Corps volunteer. Thankfully, there were no fatalities, but the island was devastated and the recovery was a slow, painful and inequitable process. In 1993, TJ was looking for a career in urban planning and he discovered that planning programs included hazard mitigation planning and realized he could combine an interest in urban areas with disasters. So he enrolled in Cornell University City and Regional Planning Program where he worked with Professor Barclay Jones, a leading expert in disaster mitigation. In 1994, TJ obtained an internship with the City of Seattle's Office of Emergency Management, OEM, where he was tasked with writing the Seattle Hazard Identification and Vulnerability Analysis, or SHIVA. The result has been recognized as one of the best in its class. In 1995, TJ went to work for Seattle OEM full-time, where he has been employed ever since. TJ retains responsibility for the SHIVA, but is also responsible for managing the technical systems used in the Emergency Operations Center, the EOC. Uh, he's been involved in all of Seattle's major incidents and has been deployed to emergencies outside Seattle, including an extended deployment to Louisiana following Hurricane Katrina. So thank you, TJ, for joining us today. We're very excited about your talk and take it away. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I am going to attempt to share my screen now. Um, so um, yeah, this is gonna be a big uh, kind of information dump. Uh, so hopefully um, you feel free to put questions uh, in chat. I think we talked about this on our rehearsal. Um, so Catherine or Tim can, can interrupt and um, I'll pause after each hazard um, so you don't have to wait till the very end. Um, just to get started, this is a little introduction. So this was uh, where the I worked when I was in the Peace Corps. And uh, the only way to communicate with the outside world was a radio in this dispensary. Uh, so I'm very uh, aware of how important radio communications are because the only thing we had was a Motorola shortwave uh, radio to communicate with the, uh, the rest of the world. And after the typhoon, this is what the same area looked like. Um, this building was completely obliterated. And um, so that's my friend Asao um, in front of the literal radio shack on Namwan Island. So um, it was solar powered four channel Motorola shortwave radio and that thing was a, a lifesaver. All right, um, now to get started. Uh, so why do we do hazard identification and why, why do we even sort of analyze what Seattle's disaster risks are? Um, and as usual, there's a far side for, for everything. Um, so I think Gary Larson really sums it up well uh, in this particular cartoon. Um, you know, uh, so the poor slugs uh, don't know wh what's gonna hit them. Um, so, you know, really identifying your hazards is the first step towards a more resilient future because, uh, you know, you can't really avoid the problems that you don't know about. Um, yeah, you can't plan for a future you don't know. So, um, you know, we have sort of a, a, a model or framework we use to identify hazards and disasters. And uh, I really like this. I didn't come up with it. It was uh, designed by the Rockefeller Foundation is they, they divided risks in communities into two groups. One were stressors. So that would be like uh, housing prices in Seattle. So a lot of folks can't afford to uh, purchase houses in Seattle and are paying way more than they should for housing, like 50% of their income going into housing. Um, and then there are shocks like earthquakes that come along. Um, and so the more stressed your community is, the more uh, vulnerable it is to shocks. Um, and so usually in, in local government, um, you do have time to adjust to the stressors and they become sort of baked into your, your local government. Um, so emergency management handles the shocks. And those are things that sort of uh, go outside the norm and that you have to address right away uh, so that they don't get worse or um, trigger cascading um, 
effects or, or disasters down the line. And <clears throat> the Seattle Hazard Identification and Vulnerability Analysis is that study of the shocks. And we consider like what hazards were likely to, are likely to occur in our community, um, what our exposure is to those hazards. So that would be um, exposure being physical exposure, meaning uh, if you live, what are the areas that are close to the coastline? What are the areas that could be hit by flooding? Um, what is the consequences of, of that uh, hazard in that particular area? Um, and we do do a state of the community. Uh, so we have a community profile that includes stressors just to, as a background because uh, that's an, it has an effect on every single hazard. And then the link below, um, is where you can find the Shiva online. Uh, you can also find uh, in an interactive version um, at the address uh, there on the screen uh, for hazards that really have a, a, um, a mappable component to them. And we're gonna be updating this. We, we are updating the Shiva this year. Um, so there'll be a new version out next year, uh, which will revise some of these hazards I'm talking about. Um, all right, so what are the hazards? When I did uh, research, I, I've been responsible for this document for a long, long time. Um, and typically we do a lot of research and, um, and I found like almost 90 different kind of descriptors for hazards and we didn't wanna write 90 different um, chapters. So we sort of kind of merged a lot of them and we came up with, with 18. Um, does this mean something could happen that's not on this list? Sure, um, this isn't an exact science, um, but we use uh, you know a combination of historical research in our area, looking at what's going on nationally, internationally, uh, talking with subject matter experts to come up with the list. Um, so this table is sort of like the Shiva in a nutshell. Um, so you'll notice on the uh, left, the leftmost column is a list of the hazards. And then uh, across the top are um, a series of, well, there are two scenarios. There's a most likely scenario and a maximum credible scenario, which we use for evaluating. And so the, the uh, most likely is our sort of quote unquote garden variety uh, disaster, if you can, if there is such a thing. And then, uh, then the, the maximum that isn't, uh, has a reasonable plausibility of happening. And then we divide those into a number of different domains like uh, health effects and economy. And, and we look at the, the, uh, look at the potential impacts in those areas and we come up with a, a, a score. And there, there are metrics that explain what a two is or a one is for each of those domains. So if you really wanna get into the nitty gritty, you can go to our website and find all that information out. Um, so what you won't see is uh, climate change. And uh, why is that? Um, because we include climate change as sort of a meta hazard. It's a hazard of hazards. It, it affects all these other hazards, these nine other ones um, primarily, and it, it just makes them worse. And so climate change kind of acts through these other hazards. Um, same with terrorism. We, it's included in a chapter called attacks. But um, really, people who want to do bad things to us can can use a lot of different means to do that. Um, some of which are already hazards in the Shiva, and so uh, terrorism is kind of the, the it's the same situation. All right, now let's go into the the most of this talk is just to me going through those eighteen and just plowing through and and explaining to you uh, a little bit about each one and why it's a hazard. Um, and so earthquakes are our number one risk. We had a, a, an earthquake back in 2001. I'm sure you, those of you who are local remember the Nisqually earthquake. Um, and um, earthquakes like that are almost a given. We have an almost 90% chance according to the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network of having a Nisqually type event in the next 30 to 50 years. Um, we, we have three earthquake sources. One, the, the ones like Nisqually are deep earthquakes because they happen deep under the ground. So even if you're standing over the epicenter, you're still like uh, 40 miles away from it. Um, 
And so it, it kind of attenuates uh, the, by the time it reaches the surface. So the waves are seismic waves aren't as strong. Um, the second kind of earthquake we have is a subduction zone, which runs from um, Vancouver Island down to uh, Northern California. And that is the worst uh, case scenario for the whole region. And it would particularly affect our taller buildings. Um, and so uh, we're especially worried about the ones from six to 24 stories because they don't go through um, design review. Uh, so they can just be built to code and um, design review allows peer engineers to, to tweak the design and take into account the most recent um, science. So, um, uh, and then finally we have shallow crustal faults which run um, kind of east-west through Puget Sound and those can produce really big earthquakes, not as big as Cascadia, but they'd be right underneath us, including the Seattle Fault which runs right through the middle of uh, the city. And that is our worst case disaster. Um, so with that, I, I want to um, play a little uh, game with you or, or it's, a, it's, a, it's a little quiz. So we modeled six of these scenario earthquakes and I'm going to just run through them pretty quick uh, in the interest of time. But just think to yourself or put them in chat, I won't be able to see it, but, but try and guess which of these um, earthquakes I'm going to show you based on the map. Um, so this is our first earthquake. And so um, just think about which one of these it is, Tacoma, Nisqually. Um, so that would be, this is a repeat of the 2001 earthquake. Uh, the South Whidbey Island Fault, the Seattle Fault, the Devil's Mountain Fault, which is sort of way up near the Skagit or the Cascadia Subduction Zone Earthquake. Ready, one, two, three. So this is the Nisqually earthquake. And by the way, red, this is just a, the numbers correspond to like how damaged, um, what percentage of buildings are damaged in that particular area. So red is like, I think uh, 10 to 50% of the buildings would have some sort of structural compromise. So, and blue is no damage. Uh, okay, so this one, think about it, think about it. One, two, three, it is the Cascadia earthquake. So a lot of areas are yellow, but you can imagine um, it would be this damage pattern, you know, over an area of, you know, three states and a Canadian province. So uh, that is a huge amount of damage and it would be a lot worse on the coast. So this is the biggest regional disaster. Um, okay, this, this bad boy. Um, so lots of red. So this should give you a pretty good idea. I kind of gave it away in the in the previously, but are you ready? One, two, three. This is the uh, seven point two Seattle fault um, scenario, and uh, this is a repeat of an earthquake that happened eleven hundred years ago. Um, so that uplifted the southern part of the city about sixteen feet. Um, so, uh, okay, continuing along, um, this one uh, is interesting. It will show you, think about it. So we've got, we've got uh, Tacoma, Devil's Mountain, and South Whidbey. Um, and here we go, it's the Tacoma Fault. So, you know, we could have the Tacoma Fault running along Tacoma. You can see it running a little bit on the, that red line, kind of a west of Ashon. That's the fault trace. So it could affect us in Seattle quite significantly. Um, and finally, uh, no, not quite finally, um, which is mostly green with patches of red. It's a really interesting fault or damage pattern. But this is the Devil's Mountain Fault. Um, so it's a big earthquake, it's far away. It would shake areas that are particularly vulnerable to shaking like soft soils. Um, so we would get um, kind of isolated damage in areas of the city. And this is the one that people don't, I, I think people don't really pay enough attention to because the Seattle Fault gets all the attention, but by process of elimination, this is the South Whidbey Fault. So um, it would cause significant damage on the east side and also uh, in our, um, 
industrial areas in Seattle and in the northeastern parts of Seattle. Uh, okay, so that's kind of a real brief summary of our earthquake risk. There's more in the Shiva. Um, so, uh, oh, and it's important to recognize a lot of disaster impacts are inequitable. And so the same modeling software we use to produce those maps, we also use to look at differential impacts uh, based on the demographics of the people who lived in the areas impacted. Um, and some, we know this is true for all disasters. So to some extent, this is a proxy uh, for uh, all disasters that we have. So you notice that and so if you see a red number, if, so like low income uh, people in Southeast Seattle, um, that plus 99% means that they're gonna be 99% more affected than the general population. Um, and likewise, if you see a negative number um, like uh, West Seattle for children, negative 40, it means they're 40% less affected. Um, and th these are numbers modeled for the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Um, so you can see that um, it affects our low income people and, and then, um, then uh, our members of our black community, um, especially bad in uh, North Seattle and in uh, Queen Anne, Magnolia and Belltown, that's the, the second column to the right. Um, so, um, so yeah, we need to be aware of that when we respond to disasters. All right, I think this is the last earthquake slide. Um, yeah, so are there any questions before we move along? Um, Catherine or Tim? All right, I will continue on. Um, so landslides are another common risk in Seattle. Um, we have, uh, landslides every year. So what you see on the map there, the salmon colored areas are areas that are known to be landslide prone. The black dots are where we've had landslides in the past. Um, the picture you see is our five homes that are destroyed uh, along an area called Perkins Lane. Uh, and um, what we're really worried about are landslide swarms that occur during storms. Typically what happens is the ground gets saturated and then we have a triggering storm that can produce a lot of landslides in a short amount of time. Uh, and so precipitation is usually the major trigger for landslides, the most common one, but they can be caused by earthquakes too. And that is actually our worst case scenario is uh, like a Seattle fault earthquake happening when the ground is saturated. It could produce thousands of earthquakes. Um, so uh, I'm gonna show a picture and you're gonna have to guess what this is. Um, so um, this green picture, just try and think of what that is and where it is. Um, so this is a tree. This is a tree that is standing up um, vertically at the bottom of Lake Washington um, off the coast of our, or the southern end of Mercer Island. So during that Seattle Fall earthquake that happened um, 1100 years ago, a whole hillside, um, we had a deep seated landslide and the whole hillside gave way and slid into uh, Lake Washington. And so there's whole stand of trees down there underneath the water. Um, and uh, you can go to this link, KUW, and you can um, get some information uh, about that. And I took a screenshot from a video that was on that site. Um, all right, so that's landslides. I'll just keep Continuing on, and so um, moderators, feel free to break in if we have questions. Um, a lot of people are worried about volcanoes because they, you know, you on a nice day you just look and see Mount Rainier, and you imagine that thing uh, blowing its top, and uh, it's pretty scary. Um, so, uh, but you know, we're we're it's not as apocalyptic as as uh, as it seems when you look at the mountain. Um, we get a lot of questions about Mount Rainier, and uh, I don't want to minimize it, but um, 
but uh, it is a significant problem. And that's why it's on our hazard list. Uh, but we have some things working in our favor. Um, so one is that we're, um, we're outside the area for immediate blast effects. It's just, we're just too far away to get hit with blast or the um, superheated gases that kind of roll down mountainsides um, after a volcano. And so the major um, dangers for us at this distance are ash and lahars, which are uh, debris flows coming down off of the, uh, coming down the, the, the river valleys that lead away from Mount Rainier. Um, and uh, so we, you know, Mount Rainier is our closest volcano, so it is our major threat, but it's also important to recognize that uh, volcanoes, even outside our areas like Mount Shasta or the or Sisters um, can have an effect on us. And in fact, they're the major uh, ash threat. Um, so ash, luckily we're the prevailing winds blow from the west to the east. Um, and so most of the time the ash is gonna go away from us. Um, so, and in the case of a debris flow, I have a slide coming up, but um, it is possible for um, a lahar to reach us in Seattle, but they haven't found historical evidence of, of one of those happening. Um, what we would get is a lot of sedimentation washing down our river, uh, the Green River and the Duwamish uh, after um, a lahar. And so that would be a problem for our port. So we would have to keep dredging out the, uh, the river to keep the port open. Um, so, um, so this slide sort of shows you Mount Rainier, and then it shows you the White River leading away from Mount Rainier and with the Mud Mountain Dam in, in um, Enumclaw. And that is a flood control dam. And so uh, theoretically, they could draw down the dam if we had seismic or, or activity indicating an imminent eruption. Um, you know, but the, the odds of it being able to um, to fully contain a lahar is not good. That's one of my to-dos for the most recent Shiva update is to check in with the Corps of Engineers um, to see if they've connected with with uh, the USGS on on um, lahar safety with Mud Mountain Dam. I suspect they have, but I'm I'm just uh, uh, not aware of it. And so you see that the White River doesn't directly connect into the river system that comes out through the, the uh, Duwamish, but the odds are the Lahar would, would just kind of overflow the banks and flow into the Green River. Um, so it is a really big problem for those communities like Buckley and Enumclaw, um, and they have, have Lahar warning systems because of that. Um, and you on the uh, right, you can see some modeling for um, post Lahar sedimentation. Um, in the Green and uh, Duwamish River Valleys, but there's a big caveat that the model didn't include a lot of our levee network. So they're anticipating that the, the flooding from that would be less than what is shown on that slide. Um, and then finally, this is looking at uh, potential for ash and you can see uh, a lot of that ash uh, coming from Three Sisters and uh, Mount Shasta. So. Uh, those are big ash producers. All right. Um, some people are worried about tsunamis. A lot of people are worried. There is a lot to be worried about. But um, some people who live on top of Capitol Hill or, or hills which are, you know, over, you know, 200 feet high are worried about tsunamis. If you live on a hill in Seattle, you don't need to worry about a tsunami at your home. Um, so in 2003, um, people at the... Uh, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration modeled a uh, tsunami from the uh, the 1100 year ago event uh, that we had along the Seattle Fault, and this is what they came up with. So, tsunamis um, are a very big danger uh, in the immediate area along Elliott Bay, especially because the tsunami would hit in a matter of minutes, uh, seconds to minutes after the earthquake. Uh, and by the way, that earthquake is very hard to, it, it's hard to know what the probability of a Seattle Fault earthquake is because we don't have a lot of, um, 
a lot of paleo seismic data because the last ice age covered up all the evidence. But we think it's pretty low, but um, if it does happen, it would be very impactful. Um, we can get uh, tsunamis coming into Puget Sound from a Cascadia subduction zone event. Um, we're going to get new models from for both this event and the uh, Cascadia event from the Washington State Department of Natural Resources this year. I'm really looking forward to those. Um, for the distant source tsunamis, mainly the effect is going to be strong currents, and so the tsunami wouldn't run up on land uh, in Seattle. Uh, still, you don't want to be directly on the shore. So just do not, if you hear about a tsunami, do not go near the shore. Um, same with a seish, which is essentially water sloshing, like water in a bathtub. Um, the primary, it, well, it can happen in any enclosed body water, but Lake Union is especially prone to them. Um, and they don't run up uh, so far inland, so they're mainly a danger near the shore. All righty. All right. Um, this is one we all have experience with. Um, I think we're all experts in disease outbreaks. Um, uh, and the picture of the theater up there is just to remind us um, how many people we lost in King County. Um, I found out that the Paramount Theater in Seattle holds a little bit more than the, the uh, number of residents who, who have died from COVID-19 in King County. It may even be more now. I, I don't know. I've, it's been a while since I've checked. Uh, but the biggest risks are uh, new infectious diseases that we don't have natural immunity for, um, like a new flu or coronavirus. Um, and it's important to realize that, that King County uh, Public Health modeled uh, a disease similar to the 1919 flu, and uh, that was more severe than uh, COVID. So we would lose more people in that kind of event. So disease-wise, COVID-19 wasn't the big one. Um, so, you know, it, it's... Um, we have to be ready for something even worse, unfortunately. Um, and we also include bioterrorism. Um, we haven't had uh, examples of bioterrorism here in Seattle, um, but we did have the 2001 anthrax attacks, and so it remains a concern, um, albeit uh, you know something that's probably very rare. Uh, we'll knock on wood. And I think after COVID-19, we all have an appreciation for the collateral costs of the necessary public health measures to slow the disease spread. Um, you know, we can't overlook the cost to our kids from being out of school or businesses. Um, so, uh, and just just uh, how hard it is to maintain social relationships. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is just another picture looking at all those empty seats, reminding us of how many people we lost. And if we had our worst case scenario, it would look like that. We would add four more theaters on top of that one. So. That is our most deadly um, hazard. Uh, so social unrest, yeah, we have experience with this one too, uh, recently in Seattle. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's just hard to predict, unlike, you know, earthquakes where we have a fault we can, um, we know about and we can imagine how big it's gonna go, you know, the fault is sort of constrained physically, same with, uh, landslides and even diseases we can model. It's really hard to model um, social unrest. It just, you know, our society is very complex and, um, you know, social conditions can change rapidly. Um, and it's important to know that uh, we're not just talking about civil disorders or quote unquote riots, but um, even nonviolent um actions like mass civil disobedience or strikes can cause significant um, impacts on the greater society. And so as emergency managers, we have to be ready to um, kind of uh, deal with the consequences of those. Um, and so in, in the one thing to add is unfortunately the high number of firearms in the US makes social unrest more dangerous. Uh, I think we saw some of that during uh, the most recent 2020 uh, events, um, 
by and large, a lot of those protests were were peaceful. Uh, that happened during May Day to um, the challenge for the police is uh, people who are intent on violence infiltrating an otherwise nonviolent protest and attempting to um, create a conflict. Um, and so our worst case civil disorder would be uh, where one group of people is targeting another group of people. Um, we've had, unfortunately had those incidents in the, in the US uh, in the past, luckily not recently. Um, but if you wanna go back to like the, the, uh, the Tulsa massacre, um, that was an example that caused hundreds of uh, fatalities. Um, you know, we've had ugly incidents even here in Seattle, going back to the 19th century, where where uh, where a crowd of people tried to evict all the Chinese people from Seattle. So um, so yeah, and it's hard to um, it's hard to recover from those because they really divide the community and um, and areas that have had social unrest sometimes have a hard time attracting businesses to come back to them. Uh, by the way, the, the slide in the lower uh, lower um, right is the uh, 1919 Seattle General Strike, which lasted three days. Um, so attacks. Um, so attacks incorporate or kind of what you think of as terrorist attacks. Usually most of them would use uh, small arms or, or explosives, but our, our or two most impactful ones, like thankfully we haven't had a major terrorist attack in, in the US uh, or in the, in Seattle, although we've had a lot of, um, we've had a lot of multiple shooter or, or, or uh, multiple fatality shootings, which is, is very sad. Um, some of the biggest events we've had have involved arson. Uh, that includes uh, a, a burning of a uh, UW uh, building at the Center for Urban Horticulture in 2003. Um, and then there was an attempted arson at the neighbor's nightclub on um, New Year's Eve. And thankfully, uh, that was not uh, worse than it was. Um, nightclub fires have the potential for, for killing and injuring scores and scores of people. Um, the Coconut Grove fire in LA uh, in the 30s or 40s, I think um, there were 492 fatalities from that. Um, and the bottom one is is the Jewish Federation shooting. So um, and our worst case would be a large bomb like Oklahoma City or a complex coordinated attack where uh, it involves multiple sites with automatic weapons and explosives. Um, so uh, yeah, and we, we have to be thinking about these. These are some of the hardest ones for me to, to think about personally, because they're, they're some of the ugliest. Um, all right, uh, cyber attack, it remains a, a big concern. Uh, you know, it ramped up uh, with, with uh, concerns over the Russia-Ukraine war. We haven't seen a, a lot of uh, fallout from that, um, luckily. Um, but what we worry about in local government, especially our um, attacks that really disrupt um, everyday life in the city. So that'd be attacks on our utilities or infrastructure. Um, and we saw an example of uh, that with the colonial pipeline in, um, in, uh, on the East Coast several years ago. Um, you know, and a lot of systems should be air gapped, which means there's a, they're, they, they're not directly connected to the internet, but, but um, that seems to be harder and harder to do. Um, so those just by virtue of being connected to the internet, they're becoming more and more um, vulnerable. And local government, we're also worried about uh, customer data being stolen or ransomware on our, uh, our own computers for local government that make it impossible to deliver services to um, the residents of Seattle. So, um, so transportation incidents um, is a grab bag of a whole bunch of different things, um, all kinds of different transportation modes, including pipelines, um, we have a, uh, a pipeline that, that goes from um, through the middle of 
Seattle from Harbor Island, which is a, a uh, island near the mouth of the Duwamish River to our airport that carries jet fuel. Um, we also have oil trains like the ones that exploded in Maine a couple of years ago that were run through the middle of the city. Um, and we have planes that um, routinely pass over our city. Uh, the bottom slide there is a uh, crash of a prototype B-29 that had crashed into some buildings during World War II. So, um, yeah, and transportation incidents, unfortunately, can have high casualty counts, and they can also cause cascading impacts like, like infrastructure failures, um, like power outages and, and water outages. And so what we really keeps us up at night is like an explosion from one of those oil trains or a or a plane crash. Um, so we have one fires chapter in the Shiva, which is mainly structural fires, but we're gonna create a new wildland fire um, because uh, the city of Seattle actually has a lot of resources outside of the city. We have uh, two uh, watersheds in the, in the Cascades and we have, uh, dams up in uh, Whatcom County in the northern uh, North Cascades. And we have a dam that we own in Eastern Washington. And so those are all very subject to wildfires. Additionally, uh, we can get smoke from, as we know, uh, we can get smoke from um, uh, outside our area coming into Seattle. And so we're gonna break that out. Um, but we do also get significant structural fires, ship fires, electrical vault fires um, that can cause high, high fatalities. Um, we haven't had a, a high rise fire like the MGM Grand Fire in, in, um, in uh, Las Vegas, but that's something we do worry about, especially because it's really hard to conduct uh, like fire drills or evacuation drills in, in high rises. A lot of our high rises in Seattle haven't had full evacuation drills either ever or in a long time. Um, all right. Uh, hazardous materials are uh, a big threat. Um, they are, well, they're a big secondary threat, I should add. Usually we haven't had too many really large hazmat incidents where hazmat is the primary threat. What we're really worried about are fires that involve um, hazardous materials. Um, the UW um, Medical Center is, is in there because in 1985, they had a, a fire that affected um, a bunch of labs where they were working on infectious disease agents. So um, we worry about something like that happening. Um, and the impetus really for a lot of hazmat planning in the US was the 1984 Bhopal disaster. They killed a lot of folks, but that was sort of a special case where a lot of people were living right on the fence line of a, of a facility that handled very uh, hazardous materials. Um, all right, I'm gonna speed things up because I notice where we, I wanna have, allow time for some Q and A. So pardon me if I kind of speed through some of these. Um, infrastructure failures are uh, where we have, we have uh, either structures or uh, pieces of infrastructure that fail, uh, most of the time, these are secondary hazards for other um, things like earthquakes, but um, we can have uh, infrastructure fail all on its own um, or without much help from a, a triggering event. So uh, this would include like uh, dam failures, bridge failures, um, crane collapses. Uh, what we really worry about are uh, structural collapses like the one that happened uh, was it last year in in Florida that led tragic um, to a tragic number of deaths? Um, luckily, we haven't had those, uh, but we have had significant structural failures, including the I ninety um, bridge collapse. Uh, I don't, the middle picture is uh, part of Husky Stadium collapsing when they were building the second. Um, the second set of stands. And then the bottom one is uh, the West Point sewage treatment plant that had a uh, had a failure that led to just a, a lots and lots of untreated sewage going into um, uh, Puget Town. Um, power outages are a special case of, of a power outage um, or a special case of infrastructure failure. And so we, we broke them out in their own 
chapter. Um, and this really covers the case where the power outage is the main event. Uh, and luckily, Seattle generates about half of its own power, and we can um, we can island. So if we if there's a problem in the national grid, we can shut off our connection. Uh, the problem is if if we get a if there's a major regional power outage uh, during a period of peak demand, we won't be able to meet all the demand just with our own generating capacity. Um, and we are uh, the, we are connected to the national grid through the Western interconnection, or that's the name of the Western grid. And it's a, the infrastructure is a little bit old um, and I think it is being uh, modernized, but that's gonna be a very long process. And so uh, what we really worry about is a big regional outage during a period where we, we during the winter, our biggest uh, peak demand for power is in, the, is in the winter because so many people have electrical heat here. Um, and so that's our, our big worry. Um, the biggest power edge we had recently was um, 2006 after we had a big windstorm and then it got cold and folks were in large parts of the city without power for days and days and days during very cold weather. Um, uh, another one we have a lot of experience, recent experience with. So um, uh, we, in a way we got lucky because the heat dome didn't, or the heat event didn't last very long. Uh, it was three days where we had the, the, the really big spike. We saw a big non-linear spike in people seeking medical attention. So it started out kind of slow, but by day three, um, some of the ERs were starting to get full. And so um, luckily the, the heat broke and we saw that, didn't see that trend continue, but, um, what we're really worried about is a heat wave like that going on for longer. Uh, heat waves can be some of the most deadly disasters we have. Um, and it's especially dangerous because those deaths are sort of hidden. Um, you, a lot of times you don't know how many people died from heat until long after uh, the event itself. Uh, we're still tallying the effects of the uh, last year's heat event, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't have the, uh, I just got sent the statistics yesterday and I can't remember the uh, number, but a significant number of people perished during that event. Um, flooding, um, we get flooding along the coasts, we get flooding along our rivers, we get, um, and we get flooding, urban flooding when our drainage system is overwhelmed. And luckily we don't have a super big, um, floodplain compared to a lot of other American cities, but uh, low-lying areas in um, along the Duwamish uh, are subject to flooding, South Park being one of them. Uh, our coast low-lying areas, um, what you see there in the middle picture is along um, Aurora. Um, and we can get, most of it's just from excessive rain, but we can get um, flooding from uh, dam failures and tsunamis and landslides and Lahars. So, and we're projected to get um, more intense rainfall. So this is just gonna get worse. And FEMA released new flood maps, which also show the coastal flooding hazard um, getting worse. Uh, snow and ice is our most common disaster. I think we often, we have a lot of experience with that. Um, we have a new emphasis on unsheltered populations. Uh, they're especially vulnerable to uh, cold and snow. And so we uh, do a lot of work coordinating emergency shelters for them. Um, and climate change isn't just heating, it can actually produce more snow events. And so um, we have to be prepared for more intense snowstorms as the climate changes. Uh, and the worst case would be resemble storms we had in the 19th century. Uh, which included some which were worse than anything recently, uh, including a storm that and a cold snap that um, caused Lake Union to freeze. All right, uh, we're almost done. Um, so droughts and water shortages. Uh, so we are, um, this is actually a little bit of a good news story. Seattle has uh, two water watersheds or, or lakes that can supply us with water, um, which is more than most cities have. So you can see uh, this is a current drought uh, declaration areas in Washington, and you see there's a big uh, hole and where um, 
our watersheds are. Um, and uh, so generally we're well-placed and our public utilities have done a good job of, of, um, of implementing measures to save water. We did have a major drought in 92, and that's actually what triggered a lot of this work. So we're not as vulnerable as we used to be. And actually total water consumption has gone down for um, Seattle um, as a result of that, although we kind of have maxed out what we can do. Um, so um, our worst case is a multi-year drought where we, we, we just have to implement mandatory water restrictions, which could be very impactful for businesses that are dependent upon that. And then, um, and then it would also affect public health and stream flow for salmon, firefighting uh, abilities, and, and of course, businesses that, that need to use water. Um, and finally, we have wind. We can get large regional wind storms. Uh, you know, the worst one was in 1962 when, when, uh, when dozens of people died across the region. Um, the interesting thing is uh, the UW Climate Impacts Group, which does climate modeling, found that uh, they couldn't really find an effect on windstorms from climate change. So it looks like we have about the same um, windstorm risk going forward that we um, that we've always had. So we're going to hope that holds true. Um, yeah, and so the, the thing to think about with these is they're usually large regional events, so it's harder to bring in um, outside to help. And in fact, areas outside Seattle tend to get hit worse because there's there's a higher tree canopy. Um, Alrighty, I think that is it. So um, the whole, that's it for the hazards. So the reason we do all that is so that we can mitigate them. So you identify your hazard, identify the appropriate mitigation you have to take and you design and make a plan and then implement the plan. And of course, there is a far side cartoon to go with this. So uh, here's an example of um, people who have really identified their, they, I think they correctly identified their hazard, but maybe they didn't, they're not taking appropriate mitigation um, or they're having a disagreement about it. Um, all right, so that is really it. And oh, sorry. One more, uh, we got this question recently. Um, why isn't nuclear war in there? Um, and nuclear war is not in there because of a couple of things. I don't know if you saw the recent uh, Seattle Times article, but it reminded us all that Washington State since 1984 doesn't do any um, nuclear war planning that was part of politics in the, in the 80s. But really, you know, the odds of the Seattle city government being able to do anything meaningful after a nuclear war is is uh, pretty remote. Um, it was interesting when I traveled to Hiroshima. Hiroshima, um, they were able, actually, their government was able to remain functional, but they were hit with one bomb that was 15 kilotons, and we would get hit with multiple warheads that were way more powerful. Uh, they also, their economic base was outside the city and remained intact, and they had a lot of outside help. Um, after the war. So um, for those of you who wondered why that wasn't one of the hazards, uh, that is why. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. So thanks for listening. I realized that was a lot of information. So um, thanks for hanging in there with me. Well, TJ, thank you so much. Yes. Good stuff there. And we do have some audience questions. Uh, um, I think, Catherine, you might have had the first couple of them queued up there, but I, uh, yes. I can jump in as well. <laughs> so, TJ, do you want to um, stop sharing your screen and show us your lovely face again? Oh, sure. <laughs> All right. Okay, let me start um, with you. So we have a, a couple questions that we had from before, uh, and then we have a bunch more from our participants today. Uh, so a big thing in Seattle is we have our Alert Seattle system. In case uh, we have participants today from Seattle who are not enrolled, could you tell us why they should enroll? Ah, so uh, Alert Seattle, if you just Google that, is an opt-in system. Um, and then you can get uh, emergency alerts from uh, the city uh, that may affect you. And, and there are actually several categories of alerts that you can sign up for. Um, and uh, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, 
is you and used mostly, I think most frequently by the fire department and our transportation department to let you know about uh, big transportation impacts and then uh, fires that are affecting us, but it could be used in other emergencies as well. Um, the, the amazing, I'm in awe actually of, of what's being done in Ukraine right now because they have a similar system that they're using to alert people to like when they're gonna get bombed. Um, uh, and so these can be really effective systems. So, Excellent, thank you, TJ. Um, I know my, personally that it was used a lot during the uh, big snow and cold event that we had at the end of last year. Um, mm -hmm. It was helpful to alert yeah. residents to be cautious. Um, so we had a couple of questions around the same item, which is, um, do all emergency management entities have something comparable to the Shiva? Uh, how do you, do you discuss them between agencies? How are they assessed? And what is the process for putting one together? Uh, so, uh, so a lot, yeah, every, everybody in all local governments in Washington state have to um, identify their hazards per Washington state law. Um, it, it's kind of vague on what form that takes. And um, so, and a lot of places do these as part of their uh, hazard mitigation plan, which is a, a federal requirement. Um, and a lot of times those just addressed uh, natural hazards, but more and more they're starting to address human caused hazards too. Um, there's some really good um, guidance that FEMA has on um, I, how to do one of these, it's a uh, methodology. I think it's called Community Planning Guides CPG 201. So if you just Google that, um, you can get the FEMA guidance. Um, yeah, and, and it's basically kind of what I outlined, doing a lot of historical research, talking with your subject matter experts, and then most recently you wanna engage your community too. And Washington DC actually did a really good job of that, of using a lot of focus groups to um, really um, get to the grassroots. So, yeah. Awesome, thank you. That's great. Uh, we had a question from Matt, which had to do with the power generation. And, and what he said specifically was, uh, that's surprising that we can generate half of our power demand. I don't know of any power plants. Is that solar or emergency generators? Or does that include Snoqualmie? No, it, it's uh, hydropower. So uh, we have two dams. We have the uh, Ross and Diablo dams up in Whatcom County, and then we have the boundary dams in Ponderé County. So I think it's 47%. So it's almost half. Okay. Well, TJ, I think we, uh, we need to give folks a little chance to stretch their legs. And um, I, we covered a couple of audience questions. So thank you so much. Um, it's, it's really, you know, we as communicators, of course, are always thinking about how we're going to jump in and help out the whatever agencies we're serving during these kinds of events. But it's, we can't do that effectively if we don't understand something about how these served agencies are thinking about responding to the events themselves. And this helps round out that picture. It gives a little bit more of an insider's view of what OEM is thinking about and, and what I'm sure that similar uh, emergency management agencies across the, the country or across the world are thinking about as they assess the kinds of hazards that they're up against. And so, you know, when, uh, heaven forbid one of those things happens. Um, clearly there's a lot of, of pre-planning that's in place and then we will, we will become part of that from the communications perspective uh, at that time. But, but this is really, uh, really valuable stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you, you guys are awesome. You're such valuable partners to us. You know, it, we, uh, we're always singing your praises and you guys are part of every single activation that we do. Um, you know, I, 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 I love having help in our, in our planning section and then having ACS volunteers come over our radio rooms with uh, updates on what they're hearing out in the field. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a big, huge uh, earthquake type disaster uh, for you guys to really uh, show your value. So I, I, yeah, I really appreciate that. And yeah, know your hazards. Don't be the, uh, don't be the slug family going for a dip in the Great Salt Lake. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh gosh, it's good to All see right. the far side again. It's been a long time since yeah. we've that. Yeah. Probably, so. All Thank right. you so well, much. I'm going to drop off and I wish you, you uh, the best and the rest of the, the academy. Mm -hmm.